Okay, welcome back everybody. Um, so this lecture is another look at you know mass balance and water cycle, uh, but this time at the watershed scale. So last time we did the global water cycle a couple of lectures back, and now we're looking at a watershed. So what are watersheds, right? Well, again, you probably all have the concept of a watershed, but this is basically the basin. So instead of looking at the whole planet, the blue uh, marble, now we're looking at one specific watershed. So we're downscaling, if you will, you know, looking at more uh, details of the water cycle. Uh, here on the left, you have a nice rendition of watersheds in the United States with, you know, that big pink one in the middle being the Mississippi River Basin, of course. Uh, but you can see that there's much smaller one here on the eastern um, United States, right? A lot of small watersheds. Uh, of course, on the right hand side, you have the Amazon Basin, so the largest uh, river on Earth. Uh, essentially, and there's all the big rivers depending on if you look at, you know, discharge or length, but it's still, you know, one of the biggest uh, watersheds and a lot of rain and we'll go back to uh, looking at numbers in South America in a minute and, you know, water balance in the different continents. So here we can see uh, input minus output and that should be a minus, actually not a plus, this is a mistake. So input minus output equals storage. So that's the basic mass balance. If you've done any uh, environmental engineering, for example, you know, mass balance is very important to solve engineering problems in general. Uh, and it's just a statement of, you know, the accumulation somewhere is just what comes in minus what goes out, right? So if you think of a room, for example, right, everything you put in the room is the input and everything that goes out the door is the output. And what you're left with, you know, the mess with, you're left with is the accumulation. Here we call it storage. Um, on the right hand side here, you know, classic example of a, a bathtub uh, filling up, right, with a leaky drain. So if you have, you know, water coming in, so Q in, and water going out, Q out, here and here, uh, then of course the accumulation, the, the accumulation in the tub, right, is the difference. So you can say that So the change of the volume in the tub over time is simply the water that goes in minus the water that comes out. Okay, now this is if we assume that, you know, the drain leaks at a constant rate and the faucet is on at a constant rate. In reality, right, the discharge is a function of the head and we'll review those concepts in a, you know, in a few uh, lectures. So in reality, this is not as simple, but again, conceptually you can think of that tub filling up, right, uh, if the inflow and outflow are constants. If it's not constant, you know, things get more complicated because now the output depends on the storage and, you know, things are just more complicated. Okay, so input minus output equals storage. Now, what are the inputs? What are the outputs at the watershed scale? And again, here on the right-hand side, you have a um, schematic from uh, Lyo et al. 2001. This is also in the uh, Rodriguez Iturbe and Port Prado, uh 2004 uh, book on uh, stochastic <coughs> hydrology, essentially. Uh, but here you can see that, you know, the inputs are basically just the rainfall, right? So inputs are rainfall. And then the outputs are, so we've seen before, right? Evapotranspiration is a big one. So remember the um, Africa um, satellite view, right? Where you can see the forest kind of transpire, this is exactly what that is, right? So evapotranspiration is a big one. And then runoff <clears throat> here is the other one, right? So essentially the water that comes down as rain goes back out as evapotranspiration or runoff. And then some of it leaks to the groundwater. So we'll see, you know, how we measure groundwater recharge and how we can analyze that. But mostly, you know, runoff and leakage. So eventually that groundwater returns to the drainage and so essentially you know all of it goes out eventually right uh, so again rainfall equals so input precipitation output is runoff and evapotranspiration essentially and so the water balance right at the watershed scale is p minus q minus et equals s which is storage right so if you change the storage the groundwater storage then you know you have a term on the right hand side now, assuming, you know, or 
assuming the storage is, doesn't change year to year, there's no recharge or discharge of, of groundwater, so the groundwater is stable, uh, then you have that very, very simple water balance here on the right where Q, so the runoff in a river, let's say, right, is equals to whatever fell on land minus the transpiration, right? So this is quite powerful because typically evapotranspiration is pretty hard to measure, but discharge and precipitation, right? You have a weather station typically near you and you have a gauging station near you from the USGS. So here we're in uh, West Lafayette on at Purdue, uh, you ha we have a gauging station near, uh, literally down the road from here, there's a USGS gauging station on the Wabash River, and we have a few uh, weather stations. One is at the airport here at Purdue, we have a small uh, airport, so there's a weather station here, and you can take that data and literally measure, you know, take the difference and measure the evapotranspiration. So evapotranspiration, oops, excuse me, evapotranspiration is the difference between the precipitation and the discharge. So pretty simple um, concepts and mass balances. So here's an example, right? And sorry, I'm trying to remove that circle and I don't know how to do it, so sorry. Uh, okay, so this is an example and sorry that green color is not very uh, good on the slide, but uh, this is data from a watershed in Mississippi. So it's a pretty small watershed, uh, order 10 square kilometers, I believe, 10 to 20. So it's not very, very long, right? 10 miles by one or two miles. Um, and again, the data is the precipitation in green, right? Uh, this is from 1982 up to 2002-ish, so 20 years of data. Uh, and in blue, you can see the flow, so the gauging station, the river flow at the outlet of that watershed. And if you take the difference, you get that solid line, which is, again, presumably assuming, you know, no change in storage much, uh, the evapotranspiration. Uh, and a couple things to note here. Uh, one is that, you know, the precipitation is quite variable, obviously, right? There's wet years and dry years, and that's how it is. And you can see that the uh, um, discharge tracks, the discharge tracks uh, the precipitation, meaning that if you have excess rain, typically you have excess runoff, right? But the evapotranspiration, conversely, is somewhat constant. So here you can see that you know, this line here is roughly the evapotranspiration. It's much less variable than precipitation. And again, that makes sense, right? Because wherever you are, there's some kind of a vegetation that does what it does. So it's going to transpire what it transpires. And it's fairly, you know, um, it's not very sensitive to the climate. So if you have a cornfield, right, a cornfield is going to use up, you know, this much water every year. And if there's more rain, it can't really more use more water. If there's less rain, it still needs, you know, the same amount of water. So there's, there won't be that much uh, change in evapotranspiration. So again, evapotranspiration is fairly constant uh, compared to the variability in climate, right? And that variability in climate is reflected in variability in flow, not really in transpiration. Uh, and another important fact here is that 60-40 rule that you find again, right? So if you Take those numbers and you look at, you know, how much of the rain goes out as flow and how much goes out as, um, as transpiration. You can see that the transpiration is roughly 60% and the uh, flow is roughly 40%. So that 60-40 rule that we found for the global scale is also valid typically, again, in general, at the local scale, at the watershed scale. All right. So more example of um, water balance at the continental scale this time. So I'm in between you know, the small watershed to the global scale. Here we're looking at each continent individually. And one thing to note is that the uh, rainfall on land is about 800 millimeters on average, right? So this is a bit less than a meter, so a li little less than three feet of rain every year on land. And what's interesting is if you look at the different continents, so Europe, Africa, North America, etc. you can see that they're not too, too far from 800. So again, if you remember 800, if you remember 800 millimeters, you want to remember 800 millimeters because it allows you to do like quick, you know, back of the envelope computations, basically. So 800 millimeters, fairly stable everywhere, except of course, South America. So that's where I go back to my Amazon river, right? So in South America, it's very, you know, a lot of the land is in the tropical and equatorial climate. So there's a lot of rain basically compared to the other uh, continents. 
conversely, Antarctica has very little rain. Another interesting fact, or precipitation, I should say, obviously, that would be snow. Uh, another interesting fact about Antarctica is if you look at the evapotranspiration, right, there's none, basically. So all the water that goes out is as either shedding from solids, right, so icebergs, so shedding, you know, the ice, uh, or, you know, melt when the temperature allows, you know, there's some ice melt and then some actual runoff to the ocean, but there's no evapotranspiration because there's no vegetation, basically. Uh, and again, if we look at the average uh, percent evapotranspiration across all the continents, you can see that we are fine again that 60-40 rule. So again, a very useful rule. So 800 millimeters of rain and 60% of it leaves as evapotranspiration mostly on all continents and 40% as runoff. Okay, and this will conclude this uh, lecture and I'll see you next time. Thank you.